Uh, yesterday afternoon, um, Mr. McCarthy raised a, a very a pertinent question, uh, talking about um, how liberalism is treated by political uh, scientists and um, historians, and about the transition uh, from um, uh, what some refer to as the older liberalism, the laissez-faire liberalism, to the new liberalism, uh, the uh, uh, basically social democratic socialist liberalism, and uh, what role John Stuart Mill played in this. And that is a very crucial role. Mill was the transition figure. Um, I keep mentioning Murray Rothbard's History of Economic Thought. I urge you, if you haven't looked at it, to at least uh, browse in it, in, in the two volumes. And um, if you're not used to Murray Rothbard's writing style, you'll find it um, refreshingly uh, unorthodox compared to other economists. Um, he didn't like John Stuart Mill very much. He thought John Stuart Mill was a disaster. And the pages on Mill are especially uh, informative and entertaining. He refers to the dithering Mill, uh, which is uh, very much uh, uh, on the mark. Now, it's a, uh, t to my mind, a, uh, a disservice uh, when, uh, let's say, in a, a typical uh, uh, college course, uh, they will deal with uh, uh, the history of political thought, and then uh, as an example of 19th century liberalism, maybe they might have Adam Smith in the 18th century, as an example of 19th century liberalism, they will have John Stuart Mill. And John Stuart Mill versus Marx uh, versus uh, Friedrich List, or, uh, and that kind of uh, idea that Mill is the exemplary liberal of the 19th century. One reason that uh, uh, he's very attractive to people is that he had a very good writing style. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, and um, a superficially very logical and rational kind of writing style. Uh, but there are very serious problems uh, with the mill from an uh, authentic liberal point of view that I will be, I'll be pointing out. Uh, much of the confusion prevailing in the whole uh, uh, problem of uh, defining and understanding liberalism can be traced to Mill. Uh, to my mind, he occupies a vastly inflated position in the conception of liberalism entertained by English-speaking people. Uh, this is a, an example of um, um, Anglo-centrism, you might say. Uh, it is a scandal how uh, few American um, social scientific uh, um, uh, university professors uh, can easily read uh, even modern European langu languages like French and German. Uh, I happen to know this is a fact in connection, for instance, with the Stanford University um, uh, History Department, although they have great scholars. On the other hand, there is this uh, lack of, uh, uh, of having access uh, to uh, works of uh, continental writers that have not been uh, already translated. You know that uh, James Buchanan, when he undertook his uh, study of uh, public finance and, and so on, learned Italian, which I think must be very a very rare accomplishment among American economists, in order to read this rich treasury of um, uh, economic thought. In fact, I'll mention it a little later on in this lecture. Uh, of the Italian economists of the late 19th century and early 20th century who dealt with the issue of public finance. But um, uh, this uh, lack of uh, the ability to um, uh, access uh, some of the uh, most important continental uh, uh, political thinkers uh, leads to a, a ridiculous overemphasis on the, uh, on the British uh, tradition, to my mind. A uh, uh, man that I'll be mentioning a number of times, I think from now on, is one of my favorite authors altogether, Benjamin Constant. And it was only, uh, uh, Constant wrote an enormous amount uh, on uh, political philosophy and other uh, subjects. And it was only a few years ago uh, in, the, uh, in the Cambridge Blue series of political uh, thinkers that uh, you may have come across, it's very useful, that uh, some of his major uh, writings on uh, political philosophy were available in English. 
And Sabine, if you know the old book by George Sabine of the history of political thought, doesn't even mention Constant. Uh, although I would uh, be prepared to argue that he was the most important liberal philosopher of the, uh, of the 19th century and, um, and worlds ahead of Mill, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but Mill um, was a disaster on a number of fronts. Uh, in economics, he held that the, uh, quote, the principle of individual liberty is not involved, is not involved in the doctrine of free trade. And here he's using free trade in the sense of economic freedom. Uh, freedom of trade, not just internationally, but in general. The principle of freedom, this is from on liberty, is not involved in economic affairs. Um, whereas, um, Friedman, Milton Friedman quotes a great uh, a letter that uh, Benjamin Franklin sent to one of the French physiocrats, where Franklin said um, that he thought that liberty of exchange, liberty of contract, uh, uh, liberty to, to work, liberty to buy and sell, is even more important than any civil liberty, uh, than freedom of expression, for instance, because it deals with the freedoms people need every single day of their lives and the freedom that everyone needs, not just uh, the intelligentsia that publishes, but everyone needs. Uh, so here we have Mill going in the opposite direction and saying that economic freedom is uh, not uh, really part of the, um, of the concept of freedom he's going to be dealing with. Mill provided ammunition for the protectionist arsenal. Uh, Richard Cobden, the great uh, free trader of the mid-19th century, complained of one of Mill's uh, writings that this is, uh, has undone any good he might have done in any other respect by pr- providing arguments in favor of protection for infant industries. Um, uh, he rejected, Mill rejected, the liberal notion of the long-run harmony of interests of all social classes, including entrepreneurs and workers, on the grounds that, this is from Mill, to say that they have, that workers and capitalists have the same interest is to say that it is the same thing to a person's interest whether the sum of money belongs to him or someone else. Following that reason, one uh, would reveal a very large number of hitherto unsuspected conflicts of interest in society. Um, well, between you and me, for instance, since uh, uh, I don't have access to your wallet. Um, indeed, in arguing that anti-capitalism is one of the hallmarks of liberalism, anti-capitalism, the well-known English political uh, philosopher Alan Ryan invokes none other than John Stuart Mill, uh, who wrote um, in the middle of of the 19th century, the generality of laborers in this and most other countries have as little choice of occupation and freedom of locomotion as they could on any system short of actual slavery. This short of actual slavery. This at a time when English and other serfs uh, were migrating in the millions to towns and cities and even to foreign countries. Um, It has to have been someone like Mill who spent, uh, uh, well, his life as a philosopher and writer, but otherwise who made his living as a, uh, um, a bureaucrat for the British East India Company not to have noticed what was going on around him. This vast migration, where Mill says that um, uh, it, it's uh, virtually um, uh, impossible for, for working people to move from one place to another. As I'll discuss uh, this afternoon, Mill was a disaster in international affairs, where he repudiated the liberal principle of non-intervention. And I'll explain that. Now, worst of all was Mill's deformation of the concept of liberty itself. His most famous work on liberty um, tends in that direction. Liberty, it seems, according to Mill, is a condition that is threatened not only by physical aggression on the part of the state or other institutions or individuals. Rather, society often poses even worse dangers to individual freedom. This it achieves through, uh, these are quotes, the, pr- the tyranny of the prevailing opinion and feeling. The tendency, quote, to impose by other ways than civil penalties, 
society's own ideas and practices as rules of conduct on those who dissent from them. Society compels all characters to fashion themselves upon the model of its own. Okay, This is non-aggressive, uh, non-coercive in the ordinary sense, tyranny, according to Mill. And this, this is on, on liberty, the great uh, uh, liberal manifesto, supposedly. A true liberty, according to Mill, requires autonomy. Um, because adopting the traditions or customs of other people, a quote, is simply to engage in ape-like imitation. Whereas others see individuals choosing goals laid out for them by what they freely accept as authoritative institutions. This is the real liberal position. uh, Mill perceives the extinction of freedom. In other words, for instance, if you're a Roman Catholic and accept the authority of the the Catholic Church, the magisterium, uh, you're not exercising your freedom. You're engaging in ape-like imitation, or a member of any other church for that matter. Um, In a striking, if preposterous, illustration, Mill writes in On Liberty, an individual Jesuit is to the utmost degree of abasement a slave of his order. I have to call Father Sadowski at the Fordham and inform him of, of this fact of which he was unaware, he has been aware all of his life. Uh, that uh, he's uh, simply a slave of the Jesuit order. One wonders what is supposed to follow from this. Must we form abolitionist associations uh, to emancipate the willing slaves of the Society of Jesus? One wonders also how Mill and his alter ego, Harriet Taylor, could ever have imagined themselves, could ever have imagined themselves, entitled to legislate on the status of members of the Catholic or Orthodox orders, the status of Orthodox Jews, devout Muslims, and of other believers. Uh, His comment on the Jesuits illustrates a facet of Mill too rarely noticed. He was, in the words of Maurice Cowling, one of the most censorious of 19th century moralists. Mill constantly passed judgment on on the habits, attitudes, preferences, and moral standards of great numbers of people of whom he knew nothing. As Cowling dryly observes, bigotry and prejudice are not necessarily the best descriptions of opinions which Comtean, uh, August Comte, Comtean determinism has stig- stigmatized as outdated. Now, there's beginning to be a literature on Mill the authoritarian, Mill the, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, secret, uh, uh, duplicitous uh, authoritarian. I mentioned Maurice Cowling has a short book on the subject. Joseph Hamburger of Yale had a um, uh, published a posthumous uh, work uh, uh, on the subject. Uh, and recently a big book by Linda Alinda Rader who teaches at a Florida university. Um, Mill and the, and the uh, philosophy and the, and the religion of humanity uh, outlines in detail, and not just in On Liberty, but in other of his works, what Mill's secret agenda was. Um, but as I say, uh, in the shorter work by uh, Hamburger, uh, he examines the dark side of John Stuart Mill. Uh, and, and Hamburger, like any, most anybody else, said he long uh, entertain the view that John Stuart Mill was a true believer in, and an exemplary proponent of individual freedom. Uh, but, uh, like Rader does in more detail, he examines not only on liberty, but Mill's other writings and, uh, and letters and the personal testimony of his friends. And his conclusion is that the freedom of opinion espoused by, by Mill in On Liberty was largely part of a grand strategy. Strategy was to uh, implement freedom of total freedom of opinion in England in order to demolish religious faith. Um, and uh, this was the, the um, especially Christianity and the received mores. Now, look, I don't want to engage in uh, ad hominem arguments, except uh, uh, I will later in the week in regard to uh, people who certainly deserve it, like Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, but 
Uh, but th- this I will say that when an individual um, has, uh, let's say, lifestyle problems, oh, you know, that's up to the individual. It's a private matter. Fine. However, when they fuel um, and provide the uh, the basic uh, 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 impetus behind his political philosophy, then it becomes a problem. John Stuart Mill had this problem with uh, Harriet Taylor, who was a married woman. I, I discussed this once with John Gray, uh, who's not now my favorite uh, guy, but a smart guy and who uh, knows a lot about uh, Mill and uh, uh, teaches at the, uh, taught at Oxford and now at the University of London, a political philosopher. And, jo- and John agreed with me. If Mill had been French at the time, you know, okay, so, you know, he has an affair with Harriet Taylor. doesn't have to erect uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, assault on society and its mores into the cornerstone of his political thought. Um, someone like Benjamin Constant, for instance, had the mores of the 18th century and did that kind of thing. It's a different uh, question. Um, but um, uh, Mill, I think, uh, was um, felt uh, uh, pretty agonizingly constrained uh, by his heritage. His father was uh, an atheist, but from a, a Scotch, uh, a Scottish um, Calvinist background, through and through, uh, the uh, mores, the, the moral values were still there. So that Mill had to um, uh, lash out against society, I think, uh, for what uh, basically was his own uh, uh, particular uh, problem. Uh, in any case, um, uh, Ham- uh, Hamburger and Rader in more detail uh, show that in Mill's view, once Christianity and uh, uh, the mores of, of uh, English Victorian society were destroyed, then true individuality would be incarnated in the future million man. Uh, on the, he uses the term on the model of Soviet man. The million man dream, uh, dreamt of by Mill and then uh, the lady who became his wife, Harriet Taylor. And the million man uh, is the uh, exemplar um, of someone uh, in whom selfishness and greed would be uh, replaced by altruism and the cultivation of the higher faculties. Now, now we, uh, we understand that in economics and, uh, and international relations, Mill was a problem uh, for people dealing with liberalism, but I think mainly in this area. The fateful linking of liberalism to an adversarial stance vis-a-vis tradition and social norms stems from Mill. It has unfortunately become standard. Uh, Owen Chadwick is a famous uh, historian of uh, religion. Um, um, Dixie, uh, Professor Emeritus at uh, Cambridge. And this is what he wrote about liberalism. Uh, Chadwick said, a liberal is one who wanted, of the 19th century, one who wanted more liberty, that is, more freedom from restraint. Whether the restraint was exercised by, by police or by law or by social pressure or by an orthodoxy of opinion which men assailed at their peril. The liberal thought that men needed far more room to act and think than they were allowed by established laws and conventions in European society. Note how in the statement no distinction is made between state coercion on the one hand and social pressure, orthodox opinion and conventions on the other. A famous British uh, historian of political thought is a man named John Donne. And Donne wrote, if the central dispositional value of liberals is tolerance, if their central political value is perhaps a fundamental antipathy towards authority in any of its forms. Dispositionally, liberalism has little regard for the past. Ah, oh, okay, so much for uh, Macaulay, Thierry, uh, W.H. Lecky, Acton, and all the other liberal historians we could mention. Um, now descriptions of Chadwick's and Dunn's are much more expressive of the antinomian, uh, lawless, normless <laughs> mentality of contemporary Western academics and the contemporary uh, Western chattering classes than of liberalism historically. Mill's view tends to erase the rather critical distinction, I would say, between incurring social disapproval and incurring imprisonment. Um, 
It leads to pitting liberalism against innocent, non-coercive traditional values and arrangements, especially religious ones. It also forges an offensive alliance between liberalism and the state, even if contrary to Mill's intentions, since it is hard to see how one can be sure of uprooting traditional norms except through the massive use of political power. Contemporary writers committed to the Millian project of enjoining autonomy uh, as the highest possible good do not shrink from advocating this course, presumably unaware of its totalitarian implications. Uh, Paul Gottfried has illustrated this in his two small books on um, uh, after liberalism and on multiculturalism. How autonomy becomes the guiding star, autonomy understood as the rejection of tradition, the rejection of inherited social norms, the rejection of religion, uh, and the uh, people who uh, take that position then feel perfectly free, as you can see everywhere in America today, Western Europe uh, uh, also, to use the state, uh, its various uh, institutions, educational institutions and other, <coughs> and other institutions, in order to as much as possible, erase the inherited traditions and values of the past, uh, replace them by their own idea of what is supposed to be autonomy. Since I'm talking about John Stuart Mill, I want to mention one other famous writer um, whose um, uh, point of view has already uh, has also uh, distorted um, the meaning of liberalism and added to this conceptual mayhem. Uh, where liberalism can mean virtually anything, anything except, of course, Nazism. And that's uh, John Maynard Keynes. Mm -hmm. Now, you can look up my article in the free market on Keynes and the Reds. This is a short version of of a uh, chapter that will appear in my book on classical liberalism on John Maynard Keynes. Um, My partner's been a long time uh, being worked on, many, many years. And my publisher, Routledge, uh, suggests that I might start planning to have it published posthumously. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody is, is uh, interested in many m- more citations about Mill on this point, that is his uh, sympathy for totalitarian experiments, as he called them, especially in the Soviet Union, if you want uh, uh, further references from Mill's writings, uh, as with any of the other talks I'm giving, give me your email address or uh, your, also your mailing address would be good, and I'll send them to you. I'll just uh, 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 get them off uh, my computer. Now, Mill is, I mean, uh, now uh, Keynes, another troubled individual. Um, you'd think on the face of it that um, uh, there'd be a prima facie case not to call him a liberal, uh, since um, the uh, hallmark of liberalism is the idea that society can run itself. That's how liberalism started in the uh, uh, a rejection of mercantilism and authoritarianism, uh, state authoritarian, authoritarianism in every respect in the 18th century, 17th century also with the levelers. Society runs itself. Uh, voluntary agreements based on uh, the principle of private property pretty much take care of everything. Uh, Keynes is most famous for rejecting this idea uh, in the core area of classical liberalism, economics, and uh, maintaining that um, a uh, unregulated market economy cannot achieve full employment and is subject to uh, regular uh, uh, depressions and um, uh, business fluctuations, uh, very damaging to the uh, masses of people. This is his economic theory, which has been exploded many times now. Um, however, beyond that, he was also a social philosopher. And I think, as with Mill, uh, there's first of all the fact that he's in the British tradition, which uh, gives him uh, a, head, uh, a head start in the minds of uh, many people. Uh, but also, <coughs> there's his style and tone, uh, which is generally very calm, uh, rational, um, civil in expression and so on, uh, reserved, and, uh, um, um, and which appeals to people. But I would submit to you that uh, tone and style should not be definitive of what a liberal is. 
uh, what a true authentic liberal is. That, that should be based more on the content of the person's thought. Uh, now, one thing that's odd about Keynes is um, his sympathy for totalitarian experiments in the 1920s and 1930s. And as I say, I can give you references in the 1920s and his visits to the Soviet Union. Oh, sure, he didn't like the <coughs> the uh, suppression of, uh, of uh, thought, of uh, dissenters. Um, very typical, again, of his kind of liberal, the emphasis on um, uh, what uh, the problems encountered by the intelligentsia, by people who like to talk and think and publish their views. There were other people who suffered <laughs> in the Soviet Union and suffered much more massively. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but um, uh, often, uh, uh, maybe less now that uh, uh, evidence has come out, but uh, very often people began saying, uh, uh, began complaining about the, uh, Stalinism at the time of the purge trials. Now, the purge trials were directed against the leaders of the Communist Party, Stalin's um, uh, rivals. Masses of the masses of people who'd been oppressed and killed by the millions, the peasants and small business people and um, uh, working people. Uh, the, the intellectuals uh, seem to uh, take that in stride. Well, that's kind of the price for building up socialism. But when the uh, when an intellectual like, like Leon Trotsky is now put on trial and con- condemned to death in the absentia, they get very excited, and John Dewey sets up an international commission to investigate the case of Leon Trotsky. Or what, what about the, the case of uh, of uh, uh, Ivan Smirnov or whoever, uh, uh, and and his family and his kids that died in some uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, village of starvation? Uh, that wasn't um, uh, too much of a problem for many of these so-called liberals. Now, Keynes, in his visits to the Soviet Union, I say, was critical of this aspect. On the other hand, uh, he, has, he had a very strange, and I can provide you the quotes from, uh, if you care to have them, very strange, uh, made very strange statements about how the Soviet, we have to at least give this to the Soviet leaders, that they are uh, ex- uh, extirpating uh, the um, uh, crazy love of money, which is the hallmark of our own civilization and the worst moral failing of our civilization. In the Soviet uh, Union, the uh, communist cadres work for the sake of the community. Uh, here he was in perfect uh, harmony with his uh, good friend Beatrice Webb, uh, who said the same thing at the time and remained a, a good friend of uh, Keynes, one of his best friends up until the time she died in 1946. Uh, or I think she died in 43, and Keynes died in 46. Um, so that the, so that uh, he does have sympathy uh, for the Soviet Union at that time. There's a famous essay of his that appeared in the Yale Review. Um, Yale, Re- it's also in his collected works, but the collected works does not contain everything he says in that review. Let me see. I think it was the Yale Review. It was 1933. I think it was um, uh, April of 1933, where he praises. The experiments now going on in Italy, Germany, and the Soviet Union. Right? Um, he says, I don't agree with everything that they're doing. And the, and the Nazis especially, uh, wild, crazy people. On the other hand, they at least have the courage to experiment, which is something that nobody in the West is prepared to do. We're stuck with this old laissez-faire system. Uh, and the people of the establishment, meant the uh, uh, Treasury and the, and the British government and the Bank of England, uh, think that that is going to save us. Well, it's not. So I wish them well, these experimenters in the foreign countries, because I have experiments of my own, this is almost a quote, that I want to carry out. Well, 1933. Um, and he also, by the way, had uh, wrote the preface to the German edition, 1936 German edition of the general theory, which is very questionable. Um, he talks about how his system is more adapted to a country like Germany than it is to a country like England or America. And by the way, that uh, is not due to uh, any mistranslation. Uh, that's what appears in the English draft. Uh, now, the land, what I want to mention now, what I, what I talk about in this thing in the free market, is a statement that um, 
uh, that he makes in a radio broadcast of June of 1936, <clears throat> where he's reviewing, where he reviews books, and here he reviews a, um, a massive tome that has just come out, a tome that has just come out from Sidney and Beatrice Webb, called Soviet Communism and New Civilization. Uh, famously, the first edition of that had a question mark after New Civilization. Later editions dropped the question mark. Um, this is known, this book of theirs is noted as probably the most notorious, really infamous act of any fellow travelers in the whole sordid history of fellow traveling with uh, Stalinism of the uh, 1930s and 1940s. Uh, most of the information comes directly from the Soviet sources, and it's an apologia for what Stalin is doing. This is 1936. Uh, the book was published in Russian translation in, in the Soviet Union, uh, as uh, they know, as the Webb's note, uh, very nicely produced, good paper, and so on. The Soviet authorities welcomed it. Uh, so you would expect then a liberal like Keynes in his uh, radio review, to attack this book. That's not what he does. He says, Soviet communism is a book which every serious citizen will do well to look into. Until recently, until recently, events in Russia were moving too fast, and the gap between paper professions and actual achievements was too wide for a proper account to be possible. But the new system, he means hardcore Stalinism, 1936. But the new system is now sufficiently crystallized to be reviewed. The result is impressive. The Russian innovators have passed not only from the revolutionary stage, but also from the doctrinaire stage. I guess that makes him a liberal. That uh, doesn't, uh, uh, he's not a doctrinaire. He's in favor of compromise and flexibility, as is shown by the Soviet authorities. There is little or nothing left which bears any special relation to Marx and Marxism, as distinguished from other systems of socialism. They are engaged in the vast administrative task of making a completely new set of social and economic institutions work smoothly and successfully over a territory so extensive that it covers one-sixth of the land surface of the world. Methods are still changing rapidly in response to experience. That also, I guess, is supposed to make him a liberal that uh, he's uh, uh, in favor of, uh, uh, he's against any kind of principles and in favor of constant adjustment to experience. The largest scale empiricism and exper experimentalism, which has ever been attempted by disinterested administrators, is in operation. Meanwhile, the webs have enabled us to see the direction in which things appear to be moving and how far they have got. It leaves me, finally, it leaves me with a strong desire and hope that we in this country, in Britain, may discover how to combine an unlimited readiness to experiment with changes in political and economic methods and institutions while preserving traditionalism and a sort of careful conservatism. That's very typical of Mill. I mean, if you try to make sense of that. An unlimited uh, 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 desire to experiment and change things uh, uh, combined with a careful conservatism. What is he saying? But uh, if, you, if you're able to follow his remarks about the Soviet Union, now it happens that some uh, authors, famous authors like T.S. Eliot, for instance, um, a number of others, uh, Mencken uh, recently, made unfortunate comments in regard to Jews and in regard to, uh, sometimes in regard to National Socialist Germany uh, in this period. And unfortunate and mistaken and deplorable sometimes. However, the whole world resounds with that fact uh, that uh, all of these authors are somehow guilty of anti-Semitism and helped along uh, the uh, road to Auschwitz and so on. We never uh, stop hearing about that if you follow these things as I do. Why don't we hear about this? You may know that the man who's just finished the third and last uh, uh, volume of his, bio his great biography of Keynes, Robert Skidelsky, Lord Skidelsky, um, uh, he's uh, uh, raised to the peerage because, I think, of this great biography. Well, 
In the second volume, where you should have mentioned this, uh, this uh, radio talk by uh, Keynes, which can be found in Keynes's collected works, uh, it's not there. I wrote Lord Skidelsky. Um, you know, I, this is the kind of people I hang out with, really. Um, you know, I started, Dear Bob, How Are Things? <laughs> and I asked him how come this did not appear. How come it didn't appear in a major article he wrote on Keynes and the Fabians? Sidney and Beatrice Webb were the leaders of the Fabian Society. And he wrote back and said, well, uh, there are reasons that explain why Keynes wrote this. Uh, He was friendly with the Webbs and he wanted to promote their book. Um, uh, He was afraid that um, some uh, Russian friends of his who had relatives in the Soviet Union uh, if he uh, wrote negatively about the Soviet Union, would feel the repercussions. But um, uh, Skidelsky said, I'll try to put this in somehow in my third volume. He didn't put it into his third volume. As far as history goes, this has disappeared. Unless you have access to the free market. Um, what what explains that? Uh I don't, I don't think that that's an honest way to operate. This is an outrageous thing for uh, Keynes to have written. By that time, anybody who wanted to know could find out what was happening in the Soviet Union, could find out about the, the uh, Ukrainian uh, terror famine um, that uh, claimed, we don't, we don't know, six, seven, eight million people um, with cannibalism in the, uh, in the villages. Uh, they could find out about the gulag that had been set up by uh, Lenin. Uh, could find out about the constant executions that were going on. So that uh, then they found killing fields uh, uh, containing uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of bodies. Anybody could have found out about this. It was in the it was in the anarchist press. It was in the socialist press. It was in the Catholic press. It was in some of the conservative press also. So you didn't have to go by the lies of the webs um, uh, to uh, judge what was happening in the Soviet Union. Well, I want to say that um, this is a uh, very uh, uh, odd thing for a model liberal to have written. Not only a model uh, liberal, but there are anthologies of uh, uh, liberal thought that say, you know, liberalism from what? John Locke to John, uh, John Maynard Keynes, as if he were the culmination of liberalism. Well, let's go on from there to um, to the uh, to a a major subject I want to cover um, now, and that is um, the uh, the classical liberal theory of class conflict. The greatest. Interpreters of this theory were French. So I want to say something about French liberalism to begin with. I mentioned to you that Murray Rothbard, in his, in his history of economic thought, uh, tends to uh, place uh, French economic thought ahead of British economic thought, uh, French and continental uh, in general. Um, as, I, as I mentioned to you, Murray's especially... Uh, Annoyed by Adam Smith and his reputation, which Murray, uh, uh, remember, said uh, his reputation, Adam Smith, whose reputation almost blinds the sun. Um, and then this uh, view that uh, Adam Smith was somehow the father of economics, continuing with Malthus, Ricardo, Mill, Marshall, and of course culminating in Keynes. Uh, Murray said that, uh, much prefers the continental um, uh, tradition of um, uh, Turgot, including Bastiat, who whom he considered a very fine economist. And there was a very interesting article, I think, in the uh, um, Quarterly Review of Austrian Economics by uh, Professor uh, by uh, Professor Hiltzman on Bastiat as a as a precursor of um, of uh, Austrian economics. Um, Hayek has not helped the cause along because Hayek wrote a famous essay called. True and false individualism. And here, written rather bafflingly, I think, Hayek attempts to distinguish two traditions of individualism, or that was the term that was that was he was using at the time for 
liberalism or classical liberalism. The first, uh, basically a British and empirical line of thought, according to Hayek, represents genuine, uh, genuine liberalism. He believes the second French and continental uh, tradition is not liberal really at all. Uh, ra- rather, it is a rationalistic deviation that leads inevitably, as he says, to collectivism. Uh, this follows high claims from the contrasting social theories underlying the two doctrines. Where the British tradition appreciates the truth regarding social institutions, that they originate and develop spontaneously, the French and continental tradition holds them to be products of deliberate human contrivance or design. I have to, Hayek was the uh, head of my dissertation committee at Chicago many years ago. I've always had very great respect for him. And, uh, and he was a, a person who probably was as good a, a scholar, uh, that is uh, learned in, um, uh, in the history of thought as he was econom- an economist. But here in this, uh, denigration of, uh, of the continental and French liberal tradition, I really cannot follow him. Um, for one thing, there's a kind of uh, funny um, game that he plays. Um, because in the British uh, tradition, he lists not only uh, David Hume, Smith, and Burke, but also Alexis de Tocqueville and, um, and Benjamin Constant, um, who were uh, not exactly uh, British subjects. Um, and among the French... Um, he, he mentions the physiocrats, the encyclopedists, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Henri de Saint-Simon. Am I going to be talking about Rousseau and Saint-Simon? I'll talk about uh, tomorrow. Um, now, it's a peculiar thing, it seems to me, if you're talking about uh, uh, liberal tradition, to bring in the French encyclopedists, uh, who are um, who have a whole bag of, whole bundle of baggage of their own, and um, um, some people do consider them liberals, but Diderot and Dolbach and so on, hardly liberal in my view. Certainly not Rousseau, certainly not Henri de Saint-Simon, one of the utopian socialists. Um, so this is how the French get um, uh, burdened with the uh, idea of being um, uh, in, uh, in some tradition that leads inevitably to totalitarianism. Hayek goes so far as to speak of the absence of a truly liberal tradition in France. Uh, well, I mean, what can you say when uh, uh, it's obvious that uh, there was a, an immense liberal tradition in the 19th century? Um, he he did, um, traces uh, all of this, uh, all of these French problems back to Descartes. Um, who uh, thinks uh, somehow uh, um, hatched uh, the uh, idea of social engineering, uh, scientism, as Hayek discusses it. Uh, but uh, if you want to select somebody, it wouldn't be Descartes, who wrote part, practically nothing about social theory. I think a much more likely candidate would be the English philosopher Francis Bacon, uh, who th- thought that uh, in the future society ought to be uh, uh, recreated on the model of, um, of science. Um, well, more, more could be said about this, but I uh, just want to point out that uh, there are uh, very serious problems with uh, Hayek if you ever come across this essay on true and false individualism. Uh, for one thing, this distinction between um, uh, individualism or liberalism uh, based on the idea of the spontaneous uh, order created by uh, voluntary interaction on the one hand versus the idea of uh, order being created by uh, um, uh, social uh, engineering leaves out of a very central liberal tradition, which is the tradition of natural rights, the sort of thing that David Hume and, and Burke and, uh, and Adam Smith were not really centrally concerned with, and certainly the, these uh, French people like Rousseau and Saint-Simon not concerned with. But there was a, this whole tradition of natural rights, and that the French kept going long after the English had given uh, given them up. Um, now, turning now to um, uh, um, the doctrine of uh, class conflict, 
which, as I say, is best developed by the French. The um, idea that the classes are in conflict is almost inevitably and invariably associated with Marxism. I don't know if you know the name uh, Hirschman, Albert O. Hirschman, economists might have come across him. He's an economist, and he has a reputation of uh, being an economist who's thoroughly familiar with the history of, of uh, thought, with intellectual currents of the, of the modern period. In one of his books, uh, Hirschman comes across a statement by the famous Italian economist, Wilfredo Pareto, where Pareto talks about class conflict. And Hirschman is obviously the loss when confronted by this, because as he says, it sounded at first curiously, perhaps consciously, like the Communist Manifesto. But, as, as he says, um, Pareto distanced himself from Marxism by talking about <laughs> spoliation. Now, what is obvious from this, what is clear as day from this, is that this celebrated expert in intellectual history has not got the first notion of a classical liberal class conflict theory. The term spoliation, spoliation, spoliazione in Italian, talk about the Italians in a little while, was the term used by innumerable classical liberal writers, including Bastiat, for instance, uh, to refer to the exploitation of one part of society by another part of society using the state. This was a commonplace of this whole intellectual tradition. And, um, uh, you know, maybe uh, you can understand sometimes why people, uh, 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 of our point of view, get a little annoyed at uh, their intellectual adversaries uh, for simply not doing their homework, not, uh, not uh, acknowledging uh, uh, our own tradition, our own uh, thinkers, uh, not uh, acquainting themselves with uh, our own thinkers. Um, you have to take my uh, word for it that Hirschman is famous for knowing everything about intellectual uh, history. And here, and Pareto, you know, is a very big name in the history of economic uh, thought. Now, this is what Pareto was Oh, this is what Hirschman was talking about from the beginning of the Communist Manifesto. The history of all hitherto existing society, uh, uh, 1848. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guildmaster and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, stood in constant opposition to one another. That was 1848. In 1837, one of the French liberal school, a man named Adolphe Blanqui, who was a uh, protege of uh, Jean-Baptiste Say, uh, wrote what is probably the first history of economic thought. And Blanqui wrote, In all the revolutions, there have always been but two parties opposing each other, that of the people who wish to live by their own labor and that of those who would live by the labor of others. Patricians and plebeians, slaves and freemen, Welfs and Ghibellines, red roses and white roses, cavaliers and roundheads, liberals and serviles are only variety, varieties of the same species. There's no doubt that Marx uh, wrote, uh, read everything on economics, read Blanqui's History of Economic Thought. Uh, Blanqui quickly makes clear what he understands to be at issue in these social struggles that permeate history. So, in one country, it is through taxes that the fruit of the laborer's toil is wrested from him under pretense of the good of the state. In another, it is by privileges, declaring labor a royal concession uh, and making one pay dearly for the right to devote himself to it through the guilds, for instance, or government monopolies. 
The same abuse is reproduced under more indirect, but no less oppressive forms, when, by means of customs duties, of, of tariffs, the state shares with the privileged industries the benefits of the taxes imposed on all those who are not privileged. Okay. So here we have, in a nutshell, uh, the liberal theory of class conflict, predating the Marxist theory, stated in terms probably nearly copied by Marx at the beginning of the Communist Manifesto, that no one, very few exceptions, myself, Joe Stromberg, Hans Hoppe, and now you, are acquainted with. Okay. So if you thought that um, uh, whatever you had to pay to come to uh, this gathering was uh, uh, questionable, now you know it wasn't. Because you have this secret knowledge. And in fact, it's going to remain, it's going to remain secret. It doesn't matter that, uh, that we publish thing, uh, these things in uh, publications of the uh, Mises Institute. Hirschman is not going to learn anything from it. Skidelsky uh, didn't change his mind about mentioning uh, Keynes' rave review for Soviet uh, communism and new civilization. Well, we do what we can. Now, by, uh, by the time that Blanqui wrote in 1837, this, this idea was a commonplace of um, uh, classical liberal thought. In fact, it has its roots in the, uh, uh, in the uh, 19th century. I um, wanted to quote from something that, uh, that uh, should um, be um, known by... Um, by the uh, by, uh, intellectual historians, and that is uh, from Alexis de Tocqueville's uh, Recollections. Uh, Tocqueville, everybody quotes, is uh, uh, almost as often quoted as uh, Winston Churchill, and in his Recollections, um, Tocqueville writes about the middle class, which historians tell us came to power in France in 1830 under the bourgeois monarchy of Louis Philippe. Okay, this is supposed to be in the period of liberalism in uh, the first part of the uh, 19th century in France. And Tocqueville says this middle class entrenched itself in every vacant government job prodigiously uh, augmented the number of such jobs and accustomed itself to live almost as much upon the treasury as upon its own industry. So he's talking about a bourgeoisie or middle class very different from what we understand, what we understood in America in those days or Britain in those days. This is a middle class that has many similarities to the middle classes in other European countries send their sons to university, to be university educated, in order to get government jobs and never have to work again. <laughs> um, and uh, what he says is, this is the great victory of the so-called liberal bourgeoisie in France. Under Louis Philippe, they expanded the government bureaucracy and created jobs for their own kind. Um, if you look up the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen of the French Revolution and the Constitution of 1791. Um, you read it over. I think I mentioned uh, that it uh, doesn't bear comparison. And that Joe did also in his talk uh, with the American Bill of Rights because there are so many uh, loopholes for government uh, action against individual liberty. But I think that the section that they felt most strongly about, that really, really was heartfelt, was where, uh, is where they say, all government offices shall be open to all citizens, uh, regardless of what, cla what uh, uh, class they come from, nobility or commoners, should have equal access to all the awards and, uh, um, and the positions and functions that the government has to offer. Uh, there were some French liberals of our sort, the authentic, authentic uh, liberals, in the later part of the, uh, the century. I'll mention, in fact, some of these um, um, uh, French class conflict theorists who said that was the essence 
of the French Revolution. The commoners, the third estates, revolt against uh, the aristocracy uh, because the aristocracy and the French monarchy had limited access to uh, government, uh, government positions and the civilian and military bureaucracies in the church and so on. The uh, third estate was uh, uh, kept out of those and had to crush the power of the privileged orders in order, in order to get those jobs. Well, that's a uh, possible and uh, fruitful interpretation of the revolution, I uh, believe. But now, I want to direct attention to some um, authors of the er very early part of the century, right after the um, uh, overthrow of Napoleon under the um, Bourbon Restoration, uh, a group of then young liberals uh, founded a, journey, a journal, happened to be called the Censeur Européen, um, and uh, began publishing their views. Their views were a synthesis of some uh, earlier, somewhat earlier uh, French thinkers like Constant, like Destu de Tracy, and like Jean Baptiste Say. And in this journal, which just lasted for a few years, uh, they outlined a uh, philosophy of history that in, uh, includes, uh, embedded in it, a theory of class conflict and gave the best, uh, clearest interpretation of this classical liberal view that I'm aware of. Um, Say was a very important uh, influence. Let me mention who these men were. The European censor, And there was Charles Dunoyer, Charles Comte, who was no relation to uh, August Comte. August Comte um, was um, one of the founders of sociology <coughs> and a, a deeply evil man. <laughs> and Augustin Thierry. Thierry became the most famous. He was a well-known historian in the 19th century. Now, as I and uh, Say was the father-in-law of Charles Comte. So there was a, uh, and also the, uh, everybody met each other socially in the salons of the time. So there was a close interconnection. Now, according to Say, um, the, uh, the, uh, the different ways of producing all consist in taking a product in one state and putting it into another in which it has more utility and value. This is what Murray is talking about. This is uh, while uh, Malthus and Ricardo are talking about the labor theory of value. Uh, all, according to him, all members of society who contribute to the creation of values are deemed productive but Say awards the pride of, place to, uh, a pride of place to the entrepreneur, which is one of his major contributions, and Murray talks about that in his History of Economic Thought. Uh, unlike Smith, for instance, who had no uh, place there for the entrepreneur, he talks about the capitalist instead. Um, Say understands the uh, 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 contribution of the entrepreneur to the dynamic uh, free enterprise, free market economy that he believes is coming into existence. In other words, we have the opposite of the pessimism of the, of the English school. Um, however, there are flies in the ointment. Uh, Say says, and, and talks about the value of personal interest in um, uh, fueling the economy. But personal interest is no longer a safe criterion if individual interests are not left to counteract and control each other. If one individual or one class can call in the aid of authority to ward off the effects of competition, it acquires a privilege and at the cost of the whole community. 
This is the origin of class conflict, the state entering into market relations. It can then make sure of profits not altogether due to the productive services rendered, but composed in part of an actual tax upon consumers for its own private profit. Um, the legislative body has great difficulty in resisting the importunate demands of this kind of privilege. The applicants are the producers who are, the, are to benefit thereby, who can represent with much plausibility that their own gains are a gain to the industrious classes. <clears throat> this is an important point. <clears throat> who can represent that their own gains are a gain to the industrious classes and to the nation at large. In other words, ordinarily, uh, if we're talking about uh, manufacturers or um, merchants, uh, business people uh, in general, well, uh, they're the good guys. Uh, they help uh, society along. They uh, produce uh, a utility for society. And that leads us to um, uh, uh, sort of uh, misdirect our attention from the fact that they're the ones who are now coming asking for government privileges. In other words, what they would say is saying, if it were the members of the, of the, uh, of the Catholic Church, or if it were noblemen, uh, or if it was state uh, functionaries who came and asked for special privileges, or right away we could see <clears throat> that, they, that they're suspect and that they're people, they are people who are trying to live now at the expense of others. Uh, but um, uh, it's uh, more difficult to see in the case of businessmen, <clears throat> which helps uh, uh, us to understand <clears throat> how it was possible for um, a noted author to write a book about <clears throat> American business, uh, uh, businessmen, the most persecuted minority, which Murray uh, responded to, uh, talking about the, uh, the history of American business and the unfortunate connection, uh, especially uh, between big business and government. Now, the authors, these authors that I'm talking about, invented a philosophy they called industrialism. In any given society, according to them, a sharp distinction may be drawn between those who live by plunder, they, and they don't um, uh, hesitate to use the word, and those who live by production. The first are characterized in several ways, the plunderers. They are the idle, the devouring, the hornets. The second are, among other things, the industrious, the bees. Those who attempt to live without producing uh, are the savages. The producers are the civilized men, no matter what the appearance might be. Cultural evolution has been such that whole societies may be designated as primarily plundering and idle or as productive and industrious. Uh, the, the history uh, they follow uh, or they really uh, uh, prefigure, um, uh, Adolf Blanqui in this, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of the struggles between the plundering and the producing classes. Um, they have the view of Benjamin Constant that the ancients, uh, for all their uh, uh, achievements, the Greeks and the Romans, for all their achievements, were basically societies uh, that were founded on war, on constant war making, uh, which included, uh, of course, imperialism and the plunder of uh, other societies. Uh, and then came the uh, German invasions. They're concerned mainly with the Frankish invasions, the invasions of the Franks, and then in England, the invasion of the Normans, and uh, the creation of feudalism. Now, I would say that they had a somewhat one-sided view of feudalism, but nonetheless, this followed in their uh, the, followed their typology. Uh, the feudalism uh, the, uh, represented a kind of subordination that subjected the laboring men to the idle and devouring men, and which gave to the latter the means of existing without producing anything or, or living nobly. Uh, they, they're talking mainly uh, about the robber barons, uh, particularly. Um, to the rapacious uh, nobility, I'm uh, summarizing uh, um, hundreds and hundreds of pages that are written along these lines, to the rapacious nobility there eventually succeeded the equally rapacious kings. And I'm uh, quoting uh, kind of promiscuously from all three authors, 
whose thefts with violence, alterations of the currency, bankruptcies, confiscations, hindrances to industry are the common stuff of the history of France. <clears throat> when the lords were the stronger, they viewed as belonging to them everything they could lay hold of. As soon as the kings were on top and defeated the nobility, they thought and acted in the same way. With the growth of the wealth of the commoners, the growth of the towns, additional riches became available for expropriation by the parasitic classes. Uh, they, uh, these writers are particularly severe on the royal manipulation of money and legal tender laws. And um, in modern times, the main types of the idle classes have been the professional soldiers, the um, uh, clerics of the state-established religion, the nobles and the bourgeois who were ennobled, um, that has left the, uh, uh, the status of bourgeois in order to become nobles, and governments. These authors had a lot to say about war and peace, which I'll deal with, uh, I think, this afternoon. In fact, the, for this, in this newspaper, <clears throat> their motto in every issue printed at the top was Pay et Liberté, uh, Peace and Freedom. One of the main uh, categories of uh, plunderers and exploiters of the present day, according to um, the um, Sanseur Européen group, were state functionaries. And in fact, I could even cite an article for you um, on them as precursors of the school of public choice. For them, and for Europeans at this time, this is the early 19th century, this is before uh, the uh, uh, War of the Southern Secession and everything that followed that, America was, was the promised land. Uh, and they cite the uh, virtual non-existence of any kind of federal bureaucracy uh, in the United States compared to France. Um, they say that uh, with the number of bureaucrats we have in France, you could have 30 United States federal governments uh, staffed by, by them, uh, although the United States is now rapidly approaching the population of France. Um, no, excuse me. This summary you've been reading, is mostly from, say, or... Uh, no, no, these are... Of all of these no, or, these are... Or, at this point, uh, um, say, say was one of the inspirations, but now we're talking about the, the class conflict theory of the Sancerre group. Well... Um, I think that uh, you're getting the idea. I'll talk, in, if uh, time permits, about the continuation of this um, class conflict view. But um, one thing I want to point out, let's go back to Professor Hirschman and his kind. So class conflict sounded like, like Marxism. Well, Marxism sometimes sounds like liberal class conflict theory. There are, in fact, two theories of social conflict in Marxism. One is the one everybody knows about, that is, in the, of the, um, the present day, of the bourgeoisie expropriating surplus value from the proletariat and therefore being its, uh, its natural enemy. Here's another Marxism, though. This is from Marx's um, description of France in the third quarter. Of the, uh, of the 19th century. This executive, it's a longish quote, but I'll, uh, try to shorten it. This executive power, the French state, with its enormous bureaucracy and military organization, with its ingenious state machinery, embracing wide strata, with a host of officials num numbering a half a million, besides an army of another half a million, this appalling parasitic body, nothing about capitalists here so far, this appalling capital, uh, uh, parasitic body, which enmeshes the body of French society like a net and chokes all of its pores, sprang up in the days of the old monarchy. Uh, the Bourbons and the July monarchy added nothing but a greater division of labor, uh, more bureaucrats, uh, and uh, therefore new material for state administration. This is Karl Marx. Every common interest 
somehow the common interest of everybody in society outside of the state. Every common interest was straightway severed from society, counterposed to it on a higher general, as a higher general interest, snatched from the activity of society's members themselves, and made an object of government activity. Now, I submit to you that that sounds very much like a classical liberal, right? Do you follow, if you follow what I'm saying here, that is the opposition of the state and state action with the rest of society. He's not talking about capitalists and workers here. He's talking about the rest of society that was willing to, to see to these various tasks, do what had to be done. Instead, the state bureaucracy snatches it away from them. All revolutions perfected this machine. This is Alexis de Tocqueville. Instead of smashing it, um, the parties that contended in turn for domination regarded the possession of this huge state edifice as the principal spoils of the victor. Uh, and here, um, Marx was often very shrewd, especially when he dealt with concrete hyster- historical uh, episodes and not his general economic theory. Uh, this, you could say, was the, his- the secret history of revolution in the 19th century and afterwards. The attempt of one group to seize the state power and everything that went with it, all the jobs, especially from another group. Um, could quote from the Civil War in France. Um, these quotations, by the way, are online uh, from a uh, short article I wrote for the Journal of Libertarian Studies, um, volume, volume one, number three, a long time ago. Um, so you can, you can check out these quotations from, from Marx. Um, now, what I, think, what I think I'll do at this point is... Um, save some uh, uh, some elaborations of this until my afternoon talk and um, invite comments and questions from anybody. Um, what about uh, Calhoun and the Americans? Uh, his, his sort of analysis of the tax box, did he have any inspiration? Did he read any of the books? I don't think that it, uh, no, I think there was a separate uh, American tradition, which uh, I'll uh, uh, mention this afternoon. Um, it comes from from the uh, 19th century Jeffersonians, uh, who were who were um, very aware of what was being done to them by northern uh, uh, manufacturing interests. These French scholars that later on were him around when the American war between the states was happening to them and coming on there. Well, uh, yeah. Now, one uh, problem was that and is that. Um, uh, often people do not, uh, who are uh, totally goodwill and basically sensible ideas, in, in my view anyway, don't really know what's happening in another country. Uh, they have to go. They are. Uh, uh, they have to go on the information that they get. The information is mediated by, you know, some group of intellectuals, foreign correspondents, journalists, uh, or, or whatever. So they get a distorted view, so that many. Northerners, uh, many, many French liberals had a distorted view of what was going on in America at the time. Edward Laboulaye <clears throat> was the most uh, prominent French liberal of, uh, let's say, the third uh, quarter of the, um, of the 19th century. He concocted a plan. He loved America, visited America, wrote about America. He was a, a very distinguished French uh, academic, um, wrote about America, and um, felt the need to do something for America. <coughs> he didn't want to do it as long as uh, the um, uh, institution of slavery existed. He was a great fan of Lincoln, a great supporter of the Union, and once the uh, Southern secession had been crushed. He could go along with his plan. His plan was to give America a present. And um, I uh, set up an organization, instituted a campaign, not funded by government, oddly enough. They got contributions from affluent people, from working people, collected contributions at factories, at schools, and so on, and collected enough to build a statue to send to America on its birthday, 
and that was the Statue of Liberty. However, when you read La Boulay on the Civil War and um, read other French liberals, it's, uh, it's kind of pathetic. Now, it happens that there was one <clears throat> great French liberal. I hope I have occasion to, to talk about him uh, because he was the most consistent, the best of the whole 19th century. He lived very, he lived whatever, 97 years or something. Uh, his name was Gustave de Molinari. Now, de Molinari may be uh, uh, a familiar name to you. you can read the few pages in, um, in Murray's History of Economic Thought because he seems to have been the first person to come up with the idea that um, the one function that uh, classical liberals typically ascribe to the state need not be fulfilled by the state, and that is the production of security. That just like the production of any other commodity, any other good, any other service, uh, can be provided by uh, competing private firms, so can security. That is, defense against internal and external aggressors. In other words, he was the founder, really, of what you could call, what has been called, anarcho-capitalism. I did this as a young man. But that is, he presented these views as a young man. And uh, there was a, a meeting of the uh, uh, Economics Society, or Society of Political Economy in Paris, where it was funny to see people like Bastiat and Dunoyer say, what, what are you coming up with? I mean, this is so, so extreme. This is uh, uh, so uh, fantastical. <clears throat> he lived, uh, de Molinari lived for a long time. and For many years, he was the editor uh, in the later 19th century of the uh, uh, Journal des Economistes. Now, it happens that uh, when Louis Philippe, I mean, uh, Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III, uh, set up his dictatorship in France, um, Molinari went back to his native Belgium for a while and edited a, a, a journal called the uh, Belgian Economist, which uh, he published uh, during the period of 61 to 1861 to 1865. <coughs> um, as far as I know, no complete set exists in the United States. The uh, Library of Congress uh, has, has one volume, uh, it's a 15-year run. I was able to find it. Uh, complete, bound, um, nicely presented to you by the uh, friendly, uh, competent uh, uh, people working there at the British Library, and was able to look through these years. And this, talk about uh, Southern supporters, talk about uh, uh, Confederate uh, partisans. Um, Molinari is surprisingly well informed about what's going on in America, and he's totally on the side of the South, that because they were fighting, not that, he's a def, uh, not that he loves slavery, because they were fighting for the most basic human right, which was the right to govern yourself. Understand, his idea was you start by governing yourself in a state or a region, then in a community, and down to the individual who decides for himself or herself what uh, defense agency he wants to subscribe to. So the, the Southerners were fighting for, uh, for that uh, uh, cause. And uh, I may actually uh, write an, uh, an article about that. In the meantime, the best source of information about de Molinari is also in the Journal of Libertarian Studies. <clears throat> you can look up under the name David Hart. Now, David Hart is currently with the uh, uh, Liberty Fund in Indianapolis. And I think uh, he has his own website on the history of liberal thought. This is one of the things he's uh, devoted his career to. Uh, he's a Cambridge uh, University uh, PhD. Uh, and uh, wrote three articles, three lengthy articles that were published, in, that Murray published in the JLS on de Molinari. So that's the best introduction in English that exists. Uh, okay, uh, now back to uh, other general questions or, or comments. Yes? Okay, very good. 
See, if you were a student of mine, I would probably give you an A in the course just for asking that. <laughs> for showing that you really were concerned enough and gave enough of a damn to ask how the thing is spelled. Yes? Which one? Oh, actually, it's uh, in uh, uh, much of what I quoted can be found in, an, in a, um, an essay in one of the Mises Institute books. Okay, Maltsev, Yuri Maltsev edited a book called Requiem uh, for Marx, and I uh, wrote an essay called Classical Liberal Roots of the Marxist Doctrine of Classes. So that was one you know, quote. No, no, there was a quote from his uh, history of political economy. Okay, everybody got that down? And by the way, in that same uh, volume, Hans Hoppe has a very good uh, essay on the Austrian theory of class conflict. Uh, you have notes available on the Molinarian Southern Secession that you can pass along? Did you, or um, did you, just, read, did you just read about it? No, no, I mean, I, I read the, the stuff itself. Um, it's all in French. The, the, the journal was published in, in uh, Brussels, so it's all in French, and I haven't translated any of it uh, uh, so far. Uh, I can give you some, if you, if you give me your uh, email and your uh, uh, mailing address, I can give you some key quotes. Um, he also he talks about this also late in his life in um, one of his books, but I think it's also just in French. What, Joe? Yes, in the previous generation before the... The censor group, there is some direct influence on the southerners because Jefferson read, of course, John Baptiste Say. Mm-hmm. He also read the Stutton Tracy and translated uh, the economic part of uh, Stutton Tracy's big treatise. And I have to assume because of what Taylor writes, that Taylor knows these writers want to be Do you think so? John Taylor's very close to their general view of exploitation, it seems to me. Well, okay, you know, could have uh, uh, derived it uh, uh, independently. Um, even people like Adam Smith uh, talk about uh, exploitation through the use of, uh, uh, of the government. Uh, Turgot talks about uh, the people who encourage uh, foreign wars in order to gain uh, advantages in foreign countries. Uh, but you're right about Jefferson's connection with the French uh, economists, with uh, Say and de Tracy. Uh, yes, young man. Yeah, um, what, do you, what do you think is the cause of the great uh, antagonism between uh, national socialism and communism? Since they seem to be very similar as far as my country. Well, that's a very that's a very interesting question. Listen, um, why don't you? Uh, I'll have a whole lecture on communism later in the week. Uh, so, if you don't mind, you can save it for for that because that would be a very appropriate question. Yeah. When Mill said he wanted to overthrow authority, did that mean? Did who? When Mill. Mill, yeah. He wanted to overthrow all the uh, social more than. Did that mean that he thought that uh, experience counted for nothing? That everything had to be thought out anew? That's a that's an that's an, that's that's an interesting it. question. That's an, now, of course, he considered himself an empiricist, and he, uh, however, it had to be controlled scientific. Uh, experience, not the experience of mankind um, in uh, all its manifold uh, uh, different uh, uh, directions, and, and that experience, and as Burke said, then distilled into traditions. You could say that you could say the traditions are the result of experience, and the experience of many more people than simply a few scientists, let's say, uh, the experience of mankind over a much larger period of time, and from that, we get traditions and uh, norms in society. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot of truth in that uh, point of view. Uh, Edmund Burke, who was a founder of modern conservatism, uh, said that uh, without traditions, uh, mankind would be like the flies of a summer. You know, every, gen- every, every generation they die out <laughs> at the end of the summer, and then they have to start over again. Uh, and they don't accumulate any knowledge uh, uh, they don't um, um, uh, advance it and progress at all uh, because they cannot build on the evidence of, on the experience of previous generations. Uh, but um, Mill uh, had no respect for that kind of uh, tradition. And his ideal seemed to have been society as a constant uh, 
advanced philosophy seminar, you know, which would lead to the mental breakdown of and and the schizophrenia of masses and masses. And can you imagine life leading leading a life like that uh, consistently and constantly? No, you know, you take certain things for granted uh, and then uh, go on and do something rather than constantly throwing everything into uh, into question. Yes? In his introduction to uh, Bastiat's essays, um, Hayek uh, is very negative about Bastiat, very, very much downplays his writing and contributions, mm. and I really couldn't figure out why he did it. You know, I just read, read that years ago. For really? Oh, I read that. Uh, I remember reading that years ago. I don't really recall it. Recall it too well. I wonder why he was asked to write the introduction then, if he didn't particularly appreciate uh, Bastiat. <laughs> Bastiat, uh, uh, where did he live? Yeah, so you know, less than 50 years, and uh, had an enormous uh, uh, influence uh, in that period. You know, when things uh, uh, seemed to be going our way. Uh, after the uh, repeal of the Corn Laws and and so on, um, Edward Atkinson in Massachusetts, who became one of the leaders of the Anti-Imperialist League later in his life, was converted by Bastiat, a man you probably haven't heard of, uh, but who, who was who was recognized as the greatest Russian social scientist of the 19th century. Boris Chichetin was converted to the free market in Russia by uh, Bastiat. Uh, the German liberals, whom I've uh, written about, myself, uh, who uh, headed the German free trade, free trade movement and brought free trade for a while and uh, market economy to Germany, uh, Bastiat was their chief inspiration. Uh, he has um, had a really a very uh, great uh, influence. One could speak of a Bastiat wave, uh, for instance. Um, he was a, 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 a believer and um, is buried in uh, the uh, uh, Church of uh, Saint, uh, Saint, Louis, Saint Louis of the French, San Luigi de Francesi in Rome, where he died. And um, uh, the one day that I had available to visit it, the church was closed. Um, as I get older, I, I, I feel drawn to, to uh, places like that, grave sites, and uh, if, if famous people... Uh, uh, Live buried. Can I fill the spell? Just spell the Russian guys. Well, you know, and uh, so you want it. You want it in Cyrillic. <laughs> no, <what? laughs> I don't show off. That's uh, how it's uh, uh, usually spelt in English, I think. Okay. Yeah. Joseph. What happened to Genoa, uh, Genoa and come over their lives? We know that Bastiat, toward his, yeah. the end of his life, sort of softened his view on production of these events. And, and you mentioned that those guys started their journal when they were young, and the journal lasted for a couple of years only. What happened then? Well, it's interesting that you, that you should um, uh, mention that. Uh, Comte uh, died uh, relatively young, um, and that is Charles Comte. Uh, if, you, if you look at my essay in Requiem for, uh, uh, for Marx, I talk about that, and it's, uh, uh, it's an unfortunate uh, history in a way. Uh, Dun, uh, Charles Dumoulin and uh, Thierry became uh, sort of seduced by the so-called bourgeois monarchy, uh, July monarchy of Louis Philippe, uh, got government jobs, mm-hmm. and um, uh, began uh, uh, changing their tune. Uh, also, there's a, this, this other thing um, um, that we see a number of times, and we have to keep in mind. It's kind of dialectic, if you want to put it that way. At the same time, there's a rise of the socialist movement. Okay? So a number of thinkers who begin by being radical libertarians be, uh, start to think, well, maybe considering what the socialist movement might amount to, you know, a reign of terror or whatever, and the socialists say we're going to abolish all private property and uh, other crazy ideas, maybe it's not such a good idea to dismantle the authoritarian state. 
and the powerful police and the army. Because we might need it, if it came to that, uh, against these crazy socialists. Uh, that's one of the things that happens in the revolutions of 1848. The liberals can't succeed because then uh, a, a, a red movement comes along and scares practically everybody else into supporting the establishment. So Dunoyer is an uh, example of that, and, uh, and I think Thierry, you could say Thierry also. Thank you. Well, 